morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2022 uh, ICT Standards Forum of SBS, Small Business Standards, uh, organized by the European Digital SME Alliance. Um, I'm Sebastiano Tofaletti. I will be chairing uh, this event, and I'm happy to welcome everyone here. Uh, we are in Brussels. It's 10 a.m. Thursday morning. Um, to start with, uh, of course, uh, we know the SBS ICT Forum is uh, an annual event for, for SMEs that are interested in standardization and uh, especially interested in ICT standards. Um, to start with, I'd like to give the floor to, uh, to Maitane Olabaria, the Secretary General of SBS, who's going to welcome us. Uh, thank you, Sebastiano. Thank you very much for, uh, for giving me the floor. And also, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you as well on uh, behalf of, of, of myself and SBS to uh, this ICT forum. Um, the focus of the forum, as you have seen today, is on digital sovereignty. Um, we know digital sovereignty is a key goal of the, of the EU. Uh, in Europe, we have actually become quite dependent um, on a small number of non-European uh, big tech companies for our digital infrastructure and data. And uh, as we have seen also in recent uh, sanitary and also the current energy uh, crisis, this um, places citizens, businesses, uh, also public authorities in a vulnerable position. Moreover, uh, this also constrains, constrains the growth of, of um, EU technology companies, uh, an part, important part of which are uh, SMEs, small businesses. Um, if we look a bit at the data, and according to TNO, the Dutch research organization, more than 90% of Western data is uh, already hosted outside the EU. Uh, and uh, we all know that in the digital economy, whoever controls data has a greater uh, ability to innovate and bring new products into the market. For example, when we look at the development of artificial intelligence in order to develop AI, we need um, Amount, a large amount of, of, of data. This is essential. And uh, if this data is mainly in hands of a limited number of big tech companies uh, outside Europe, this can indeed create a position and in which uh, Europe might not be able to develop uh, the technologies and be competitive as we all would like it to be. Uh, moreover, um, when we look at the legislations in other jurisdictions, we also see that um, in some countries this also might uh, contradict some of our European values. Um, we just need to look, for example, at the uh, Chinese sur surveillance regulations, for example. So when we look at this context and when we look at um, digital sovereignty, it's a complex issue. We need to look at many aspects like um, funding for innovation and for uh, SMEs, um, to tackle unfair competition as well in the market, uh, ensuring that uh, we have the right legislative environment. The Commission has already um, um, put forward many uh, legislative proposals in the last years uh, with the objective also to, um, to um, try to, ar ar and to reach this objective. Um, such as the AI Act, the Data Act, uh, more recently also the Cyber Resilience Act, the, um, mar the Digital Markets and Services uh, legislation, but also recently, um, well, recently, in February this year, uh, the Commission has also put forward a standardization strategy. And this standardization strategy also highlights the, important, uh, the importance of standardization in this context. This is also something we should not forget, the importance of standards. Uh, indeed, the standards are important for the uptake of new technologies, for en enabling different products to work uh, together, to exchange information and access data. And according to the standardization strategy, uh, if, we want to, um, if we want to ensure uh, digital sovereignty as well as um, a green and digital transition and also Europe's competitiveness, we need, uh, on the one hand, uh, to have an effective and inclusive European standardization system that is also able to tackle the challenges we have ahead. 
And on the other uh, hand, we also need to uh, make sure that Europe regains its position and has influence in the developing of international standards to ensure also that these standards meet European values. I'm not going to go into detail on that because I'm sure our keynote speaker will probably tell us a bit more about it. But I think from the side of um, SBS, I would like to, uh, to stress that uh, we are supportive of the strategy and we especially welcome the focus of, um, regard, of in regarding inclusiveness and SMEs in the, in the strategy. We think this is very important because SMEs are key to innovation. They are increasingly present in the technology in, uh, intensive industries and, and they are very active in developing innovative uh, applications and solutions. So as the title of the event today says, we need a vibrant SME ecosystem in order to also ensure our digital sovereignty. As I said, an important aspect of this uh, ecosystem are standards. Uh, but we also need um, to admit and see, and I think it's obvious uh, for uh, all of us, that SMEs are less well represented in standardization than bigger companies. That's a fact. The main problem is that um, SMEs sometimes are not aware about the benefits of the standards. Um, they also lack time and resources. They have less resources than large companies to engage in standardization. But this is key and this is important because if they don't engage, uh, we have the danger to have standards that instead of supporting digital sovereignty, instead of supporting also uh, um, small companies, uh, create barriers for them. So it's important that we also ensure as part of these ob objectives that SMEs are well represented in standardization. And this, ba this is basically the role of SBS, to represent and defend the interest of SMEs in European and international standardization and to uh, make sure that SMEs can benefit from standards. We do this in many ways by appointing uh, technical experts to international and European technical committees. We also support these experts in their work. We develop tools to ensure as, uh, standards meet SME needs, like the SME compatibility test that SBS developed uh, a couple of years ago. And we also raise awareness of the importance of standards. Um, and we provide platforms like the one here today in order to have a dialogue between policymakers, SMEs, standardization bodies uh, to discuss these issues. So I think, um, Sebastiano, I, I will conclude now just uh, maybe with a message. SMEs, I think, is quite clear an ally in the quest for uh, European uh, digital sovereignty. And uh, that's why we need a vibrant ecosystem uh, for them. So I just conclude there and I just wish everybody a very interesting conference and I'm sure it will be uh, taken into account the, the subject of today. Thank you very much, Maitane, uh, for, for your interesting and, uh, and nice welcome welcome address. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our a keynote of today, who is from uh, representing the European Commission. <coughs> Gwenole Kosigu is Director for uh, Digital Transformation and Advanced Value Chains in, in DG Grow, uh, the Director General which really uh, cares about uh, enterprises and economic development uh, in, in, the, in the Commission. So, Gwen uh, will also try to address the topic of today and uh, digital sovereignty, you know, how SMEs can contribute to, uh, to, to digital sovereignty in, in Europe. So, so Gwen, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sebastiano. For, thank you for the, to you for the invitation to participate in, um, in uh, the ICT forum, uh, especially because it's on the subject uh, digital sovereignty, creating a vibrant ecosystem for SMEs, which is really close to uh, our policy agenda. Um, you know that uh, the, the terms uh, strategic autonomy, open strategic autonomy come very often for the last few months of, um, in, in, the, in the Commission. Um, first, I'd like to excuse uh, my Verruta, our newly appointed uh, Chief Standardization Officer who couldn't make it today. But that gives me the opportunity to come and see you, which is uh, the positive thing for me. Um, and I intend to focus uh, on how we in the Commission uh, see the changing landscape for standardization, 
the implications of priorities for our action at European level, including our new standardization strategy. But I will have to do that in a very sketchy manner, given the fact that we cannot spend two days on, the, on, on this subject. Um, standardization is first and foremost a technical bottom-up exercise where different experts produce standards which can be used in support policies and legislation. Uh, this was like this, this will remain like that, but we do a strategy is actually to stress the fact that standardization is extremely important, it's, it's more than that, and I'll come to that. Uh, but to come back to the work that's been done um, over the last 30 years, roughly since the single market uh, exists, uh, I think that the benefits of standardization are obvious. Uh, and it's actually a key instrument that has helped, or that has allowed us actually to uh, to create an open access to 27 uh, markets. What do I say? 27 markets, 30 markets, in Europe, and even more than that, uh, with one solution. Um, this being said, and that's quite normal, uh, over the 30 years, the world has changed and it's even more changed in the recent years. Um, we all have to face two new realities of a more political or strategic nature, which concern standardization. The first one, a major one, uh, is that standardization is now not only used by companies in order to develop technical solutions, but it is also used by countries as a geopolitical tool. The second new reality is the lack of specific standards in certain important areas, which corresponds to our priorities, which, which, and when this lack of standards constitutes a severe problem to society and the market, even more than for legislation. This is the case, for example, and we have plenty of examples, but I'll give you the example of hydrogen, where we don't have the standards we need and it delays the take up of this technology and, of course, uh, the, the transition uh, in the green area. Therefore, uh, we see on one hand an added value in specific cases to accelerate and prioritize the production of certain standards in strategic sectors. And on the other hand, we also need, see uh, the need to bridge between the technical level, which is the traditional one, and the political dimensions uh, dimension of standardization. And this is where uh, the concept of chief standardization officer comes in. Uh, the focus of the CSO is on strategic matters, uh, priorities, urgencies in standardization with the aim ultimately to produce added value for the union, for the European Union. And technology sovereignty, digital sovereignty are of course part of that picture. Um, I know I oversimplified the, the matter, but um, technical, technological sovereignty can be, it's, it's difficult, but it can probably be more easily reached uh, if EU organizations take a leading role in, in EU standardization. A key point is to produce standards that stem from European principles and know-how. Uh, that's true in different fields. Uh, just, met, just think of uh, artificial intelligence, cyber, uh, new internet protocols. We need our EU values to be respected and imposed. And we don't want, as an example, that standards on artificial intelligence allow discriminatory behaviors or that they are used for mass surveillance. We want to choose also ourselves uh, which data we share with third parties. Uh, that they're not like in certain other regions, that they it's not considered that your personal data all belong to state or that they all belong to private companies. Um, we want to maintain control over our digital infrastructure and we want to secure it from cyber threats. I hope the hurricane that is now in Florida has uh, didn't come to Europe yet. Uh, um, uh, so that's the type of digital sovereignty we are uh, looking for. Um, so what do we want? Well, we want standards that are implementable by SMEs without too much burden. And at the same time, 
we know that EU SMEs are often oriented to high quality, thus we want the quality reflected in our standards. And that's why we are strongly advocating for our SMEs to be fully involved in the standardization processes. The strategy and its related actions, and that we started implementation the, the day after adoption, actually, uh, they aim at making SMEs heard in the standardization process. They don't only aim at that, but they notably aim at that. So what do we try to do? Uh, if you read this recent standardization strategy, you will see that there are four pillars that we use to present, you know, internal, international, uh, pre-normative skills. So internal, we want a smoother process, we want better governance, and international, we want to keep our, uh, our important role. Uh, we want to better coordinate so that we can actually push for our priorities or be more aware when uh, unwished developments take place. Uh, on R&D, we want to better link researchers and standardizers so that standardization need is taken into account early in the process. And on skills, we want to work with all stakeholders so that we can actually uh, progressively replace our aging male important standardizers community with a more diversified and uh, younger uh, uh, population. But for today's purpose, I would insist on three aspects. We want to respect the structure of standardization, which in order to be a bit closer to, to the subject of discussion today. First one, I mean, there are three big directions. Legislation, policy, finance. Uh, legislation. We have proposed legislation, uh, which is now in the final phase of adoption, uh, in the, what we call in our Brussels jargon co-decision between the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament. And uh, this amendment to the standardization regulation aims at ensuring uh, basically good governance principles in the European standardization organizations as regards their decision making. But also, uh, we, we, with respect to inclusiveness, which means that we want you to have a strong say in the standards you need. It's essential that SMEs and other societal stakeholders, like NGOs, like the unions, um, involved in standardization processes for new, that they are involved for in standardization processes for new and emerging digital technologies and application domains uh, in order to defend their interests and their rights. Second policy, um, Standardization is complex. I think we can all agree on that. Um, and, and we can also agree that we in the Commission and the various actors have roles and responsibilities that differ. They are not the same. Uh, but there's one thing which is certain that is we need everyone to make standardization a success and to build an ecosystem where our stakeholders can contribute to strategic matters, education, international dimension. Uh, national and societal engagement, and I, I only name those, but there are more, there are more on that. So I uh, invite you to read the standardization strategy to see how we've taken a bird eye view in, uh, in addressing standardization from a strategic perspective. Legislation, policy, now finance. Um, we all know that this is a challenge because standardization requires commitment, but it also requires resources. And on top of that, recent macroeconomic developments, well, I would say even more than macroeconomic developments, don't really help. Uh, we've got uh, supply chain interruptions, we've got uh, rising energy prices, which clearly have a negative impact on the situation. And it's obvious that we can't ask you to contribute to standardization if you're striving to survive yourself in the market. Um, but we... but. But uh, there is a but, because we still want you to be involved in standardization. Uh, I think we can achieve more, much more together than we, could, than we could achieve individually. And this is why we're working with the associations, uh, like SBS, like digital SMEs, uh, and with national standardization bodies to streamline efforts. Uh, in that context, I'd like to stress that we welcome exploring new ways of channeling the knowledge of SMEs into standardization. Uh, let me take the example a French example, it's not because I'm French, but, um, but uh, there's a French example of France Digital and their AI uh, startup platform, which allows SMEs to pull resources 
and to channel their inputs into standardization with significant cost savings. I think that's that's one of the sources of inspiration that we that that at national level could be could be looked for. Uh, we would be, of course, uh, happy to discuss with you new methods, uh, any idea that you might have, if possible, good ideas. I mean, that would, that would save time to everybody, but um, uh, but uh, we're open because we don't we don't have the real truth. Uh, in addition, uh, I have to remind that we already in the Commission we are financing the system, um, and again in the strategy uh, you will see that there's heavyweight financing programs of the Commission, for example, Horizon Europe and Enterprise Europe Network, we, which we will now be used. Uh, to find standardization activities as well. Uh, I was probably too long, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. But um, indeed, there's of course very much more to present to standardization. So please go have a look at strategy. And if you've got more questions, we'll be delighted to answer them. Uh, and again, we're open to ideas, suggestions. Thank you very much, uh, Gwen. That was very interesting. You touched upon several interesting points. Uh, you, for instance, mentioned uh, the importance to foster the development of uh, uh, new standards in critical areas such as AI, cyber, uh, new internet protocols. Uh, we know that the election in ITU is very important, by the way, uh, and we hope uh, that uh, a Europe-friendly candidate will make it. But anyway, uh, you and the strategy actually also uh, puts a lot of emphasis on the development of, of, of new standards for, for those technologies which are, are coming and are new. But uh, the question that we hear very often from our SMEs is uh, what happens with the existing technologies which are already mature, but which the market has not really adopted. And uh, they often have to do with connectivity, with uh, IoT, the Internet of Things. So we know that in the market there are still several proprietary solutions which are competing and also standards uh, which are not necessarily open standards which are competing uh, and therefore this creates a lot of burden, uh, a lot of it raises cost for, for users, it hampers the innovation by, by SMEs and the adoption of, of these technologies. At the same time, we know that the European industry has led in the development of, for instance, a very uh, globally recognized standard, which is 1M2M, machine-to-machine, uh, for machine-to-machine communications, which was led at Europe by, by Etsy. Um, and we know that other jurisdictions, uh, I learned that Korea, uh, Korea and, and India have elected it as their national standard for applications like smart cities. Uh, Europe does not seem to have a, a, a strong strategy in how to adopt standards which are not related to regulatory purposes, if you see what I mean, but just market-driven standards. So we are strong in developing new standards that become uh, recognized at the global level, but then our public and private sectors are fragmented. We don't, ha we don't seem to have a strategy. So is this something that we, we, the Commission thinks is also an issue and we, we would like to, to address in the future? No, it's clear. I mean, the, as I mentioned, the standardization is a bottom-up exercise. It remains a bottom-up exercise. That's, uh, that's the nature. Nobody, I mean, everybody will be on our back if we are uh, uh, trying, uh, thinking of doing it uh, uh, purely top-down. So that's, of course, something that we will uh, avoid. There is... From there, of course, derives the fact that there is nothing uh, impeding stakeholders to develop standards. Um, and then afterwards to push them in the market, uh, where we it can influence in when there is a public activity or be it legislation or public procurement, maybe as well. Uh, but public procurement, we have a framework at the European level, but as you know, uh, most of the Public procurement takes place at the national level, so that's also that's perhaps also an effort you have to do to convince uh, national authorities, regional authorities, local authorities, because that's where public procurement takes place. Um, uh, what we do at European level, of course, uh, when we've got our EU policies and EU legislation, then um, we want to re we first have got our. Uh, 
uh, obligations, as you know, but are, and for, it, uh, it, draw, it, it actually draws to the fact that sometimes people come and complain to us because there are EU deviations to international standards, uh, and we are trying to minimize that risk. But uh, it's clear that the standards that we use and support our legislation have to correspond to our values. That's one thing. And to our and to legislation, I mean, or the legislative principles, regulatory principles. We want to reinforce that also the this connection between standards and policy, and not only legislation. And that's also one of the reasons why the high-level forum has been foreseen by the new standardization strategy, so that people can discuss priorities and can work on the standards that would serve these priorities. Uh, they might conclude in legislation, or they might not automatically conclude in legislation, but at least there will be a sort of community of thought uh, when people say, OK, that's a priority, let's work and let's work on standards. Uh, I think that that could be, that could be a, um, a, a, a way to improve the situation. I'm not saying by that that you will not have to work, fight with the various types of private initiatives of different types uh, uh, ever. But thank you anyway for, for your attention to the, to the issue and uh, I think I agree with you that the high level forum, uh, I have a lot of expectation and hope it will be the place where we can together discuss and find common strategies also for the adoption uh, of, of successful standards. Uh, second question, and then and we'll, we'll let you go, uh, is uh, about international standardization. So the participation of um, European experts, European representatives uh, uh, in international standardization. I know the Commission wants to support that um, uh, with different uh, schemes, different instruments, uh, because that is part also of uh, enforcing Europe's digital sovereignty, obviously, especially in, in ICT standards. Uh, but the question will come naturally, and it is, so how do we actually, even if we increase the participation of European experts, how do we actually coordinate, uh, coordinate uh, this and make sure that these experts actually go in, this, in, similar, in, in, in the same directions at least, they share the same values, and that they actually are there for the common interest of, of, of Europe? So what are we doing at the international level? Uh, it's of course international. The international dimension is also complex. Uh, there are various dimensions that have come to that, uh, and the roles and responsibilities of the various actors are not the same. Um, what we are trying to do there is the first thing is that um, I was mentioning deviations. So we're we've, we're in touch with the uh, ISO IEC in particular, actually, to smoothen the the work and to improve the understanding of what we are doing and why, given the specific role standards are given in EU in support of legislation, uh, they have to respect certain criteria. Uh, and the, the role with us, the has consultants actually to play and to, and to play in ISO IAC helps, of course, that, that connection as well between the international level and the EU level. The second thing we, we do actually is that uh, we work with partners and we started with the US, TTC, in order to identify priorities that we want to, for which we want to push for standards at the international level. And I was also mentioning sometimes uh, unwished developments that we might want to avoid. Uh, but in, in our thinking, uh, we start with our American friends, but there's no reason why it should be limited to American friends. Uh, personally, in my professional life, uh, I've actually worked extremely well, actually better with that than with the Americans, with Japanese, yes. uh, on, on these aspects of regulation and sterilization. Uh, so, um, I mean, I do, not, I do not see any reason why our Japanese friends should not be part of the game. Um, the, the, the issue of um, involvement of SMEs, we also think that uh, that's the structure of national standardization bodies that can help. Um, we we I mean, have to recall that the commission is also supporting already uh, stakeholders, including SBS. And that I mentioned that as well, the commission funding programs are also going to be possible to use of certain of them. Coordination, I would be a bit careful in the sense that uh, first, we commission, we are not in international standardization bodies. So, second, 
there might be there might be good reasons why national standardization bodies that who are who participate actually might take different views in certain aspects. They can be economic, and everybody has got his own economic interest. They can be, I would say, cultural, historical. Uh, that can happen as well. This being said, when it comes on uh, important principles and values, uh, I'm less worried in the sense that I would expect them naturally to, to take the same approach. I, actually, I would expect not only our member states to take the same approach, but the like-minded countries, I was mentioning two uh, earlier on, uh, which would actually, in most most cases, go along that line, certain is in particular. I mean, I remember when we were discussing uh, 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 GPSD, um, uh, general, uh, general Data Protection, uh, GDPR, sorry. Um, we had a debate in Tokyo where you had uh, an American uh, representative, a Chinese representative, a Japanese representative, and myself. And exactly. guess what? Guess what? Uh, there were two agreeing on the approach taken by GDPR. It was myself, of course, by definition, and, and the Japanese. And Japan. uh, the American Chinese friends were a bit less enthusiastic about what we are doing. So, I mean, uh, I think on those things, I would expect uh, Europeans actually to have a naturalism. Good, thank you very much. And indeed, uh, associations like Digital SME Alliance and SBS will definitely help in creating, you know, some kind of coordination and common positions whenever possible. Thank you very much, uh, Gwen. Um, it was good to have you here. Um, with this, we close the first uh, the first part of, of the event, and we can call in the speakers for for the first uh, for the first session of uh, of panel. Thank you. Christina Beluskaite um, and Isabella de Michelis, uh, who will be here for the first uh, for the first panel. Uh, together with them, uh, we have Emilia Tantar, who's connected uh, uh, remotely. Um, now we are preparing the scene. <clears throat> So let me let me hand over to, to Justina Bioscalite of the European Digital SME Alliance, uh, who's gonna who's gonna moderate uh, who's gonna moderate the panel. Uh, just Justina, when you are ready, you can start. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much. So welcome to our first panel discussion today. And I'm very pleased to announce that we now will be speaking with SMEs, so really the ones on the ground bringing digital sovereignty to Europe. So we are jumping a bit from a more political part of the session to the real life. And I'm pleased to have Emilia Tantar here online today with us. Emilia, can you hear us? Are you there? Are you good? Yes, thank you. Uh, all good on my side, and apologies for not being present due to COVID. I'm in isolation, so you will see the quarantine room. Maybe we could Perfect. ask. Yes, we, could we, ask we ask to make Emilia a bit louder so that we can hear her too. Thank you, Emilia. The viewers hear you well. It's just us in, uh, in the audience that will hear you better now. So, Emilia is also CEO and founder of Erniap. And we also. Yes. I'm sorry. It's okay. No problem. <laughs> Isabella, yes. You are here next to me? Yes. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Good morning to everyone. The mic. Oops. You need to turn it on. Which one? Is Which, it? Whichever. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, it happens mm -hmm. at conferences, micros, they're all different because they're not standardized. <laughs> <laughs> so, hello to everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I'm Isabella de Michelis. So we will start uh, very simply today. Do you have some maybe comments? Because we heard a very interesting speech before from uh, from Sebastian, also from uh, Maitan, but importantly from Mr. Kozigu. Do you have some immediate comments, some reactions, since he was asking for opinions from SME community as well? 
Um, if the question is for me, yes, I do have a couple of uh, comments as reaction. It is always interesting. I'm an entrepreneur. I founded a company that is based in Ireland. It's called Ernie App, uh, or uh, the uh, tag name is the Privacy Knowledge Manager. It's an application that is used by consumers to manage their privacy settings configuration online with a one-click rule. You know that in ICT, you need to have things made simple, but privacy is a very complicated domain. And usually that's a space for enterprises to be interested in and to standardize because there's a lot of money to make in privacy compliance. So we decided to take it the other way around, that is to give to the users the right to the clicks that serve to manage the value they generate online. And this is an area where actually there's very little standardization and there is much need of standardization. So to go back to the point of the president's speaker as to what is the role of the commission in that space, I, for example, was very intrigued that he talked about um, an event in which China, US, Japanese delegate, mm -hmm. and himself were talking about GDPR and standardization in that space. Because there's very little transparency as to what the Commission is doing on standardization for privacy. So um, I'm very curious actually to follow up with him on actually what that is the intent, and maybe the association SBC and Digital SME, of which I'm very proud to be part of, can actually have a new channel of communication with the Commission. Because the tradition with the Commission has always been to standardize uh, supply chain, manufacturing, uh, connectivity, telecommunication, electricity, and data. And today we're here to talk about the data sovereignty, the data economy. It's a complete new space of standardization, whereas there's a lot to do. Thank you, Isabella. That's a very, very good insight. Indeed, we are here for that, to make a bit more bridging between what Commission does and, uh, and the real world that you function in. Uh, Emilia, do you have anything to add? Do you have any initial reactions that you would yes. like to share? Uh, thank you. So I will try to be a little bit louder. Mm, I was really pleased to see the inclusiveness of SMEs. It was first presented by the SME, uh, SBS Secretary General and then uh, by the European Commission representative, which is a really needed point as part of the standardization since uh, 2008, when AI entered into standardization, uh, we could witness that not many SMEs are represented. The only representatives of SMEs are the SBS, and this is also at the international level. So to see how we can have more and more SMEs representing and to have uh, initiatives uh, which assess how many SMEs do we have, for example, in European standardization, that would be something uh, to be supported. I was pleased to hear that twice uh, to this morning. I think it is key uh, to have uh, uh, exact measurements where we stand in terms of SME representativeness and how we can reinforce that. And we uh, had um, the plenary just recently on the same plenary Joint Technical Committee 21 uh, this week. And we could see there was a um, proposal to have a task force for SMEs um, in order to reinforce uh, their presence and also concrete instruments, how SMEs could leverage standards, how is the standards can be created such that SMEs can operationalize that without being the large cost. That would be my initial thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilia. So I see that both of you are going a bit to the direction mentioning more transparency of what Commission is doing, right? More inclusiveness for SMEs to be involved into these processes. But perhaps to make it a bit more clear for our um, viewers today, can you a little bit explain how do you think what's the role of SMEs in digital sovereignty in general? Uh, how SMEs contribute to digital sovereignty? And why is this important? Why is it important for Europe in general? Shall I start? Please go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I think the European Commission has taken a very courageous step in talking about digital sovereignty. We all know a little bit more compared to a couple of years ago and three years ago about what this is about. It's the direction. It's far from an implementation. And SMEs are part of the equation for the implementation. We cannot expect the very large big companies to go quick to the implementation because they're going to be defending some of their market shares and some of their strengths in the market. And they have significant strengths in digital. That applies to the Europeans as much as to the Americans and to some Chinese. 
but the disruption as to what really the digital uh, internal market for data is implying for SMEs is huge because we are entering into a, what I would say the biggest liberalization wave of data that has ever occurred in the times. And it means data are going to be reused. And if they are reused, they can be reused by multiple players. And who these multiple players are? The SMEs. The how to get access to this data, it's a critical fundamental piece of the story. Because we're not just talking about exchanges, we're not talking about the technicalities of sending data from one place to the other. That's already happening. There are a lot of APIs in the market. Well, I can tell you there are no APIs on privacy, but that's a different story. But for the, for the success of the digital sovereign policy, there must be reuse of data for multiple purposes, which may be commercial or non-commercial. So one of the areas where we really see the SMEs making the difference is to make up their voice about what these purposes are. Is it for scientific research? It is for uh, services to enterprises. It is for improvement of public services. It is for just launching a new initiative. I cannot tell you how difficult it is for young inventors um, to grab the data they need to launch their machine learning algorithm. And it has a price. Every data in the market has a price. So we need to create fluidity and liquidity. And that can only happen with an open, transparent framework for data sharing. So SMEs are really important to make up voice. Yes, we want the access to this data. I really like the point that you are making since I've heard it many times already being discussed in different events in our community, that indeed by opening up data, making data more accessible to SMEs, uh, we are making a big step towards European digital sovereignty in general. One of the reasons why is because that allows SMEs uh, to open the secondary market to, uh, to, to allow to reuse, repair and innovate the products that already are there, right? So that's really going hand in hand with uh, digital sovereignty and values of EU with uh, twin transition purposes. So just for you, maybe if you can elaborate a little bit further, what does this mean for Europe? If all these SMEs are in this ideal scenario, um, where they have this data, it's what a happens? Good, it's a good question. So first of all, you need to have catalogs. If there are no catalogs, there's no place to go and search for the data. And the catalogs needs to be open. And they must be securely accessed. So you can't just have everyone getting into the catalog and saying, oh, I want that string of data from that particular enterprise or that particular country or that particular government. You, know, you have to have a structure in place that is called a transparency framework, a trust and transparency framework. You have to have secure credentials to access the catalogs and you have to have proper and secure APIs to transfer the data. More importantly, you need to have fluidity. That means that antitrust has to apply into all the data can be accessed and by whom, and asymmetric regulation will probably be needed as well, as much as we had it in the old times back for telecoms and other spaces in which the big will try to defend their assets in a way that is to share less, and actually they have to share more. But the, what it is really important is that the sharing can, must continue to be on market-based. It has to be on a supply-demand equilibrium. There cannot be a price fixed for data. There cannot be too stringent conditions for accessing the data. That would be damaging the small enterprises as much as the big. The big may be sitting on a huge amount of data. They don't even know that may be compelling for a small, but the small need to know where to get this data. So the European have started not only talking about digital sovereignty and legislative efforts, but they're also trying to put up in place frameworks to do that. So everybody knows about the effort around GAIX and uh, around other data exchanges environment. It's critical that the catalogs exist and it's vital that the enterprises, the small medium enterprises know about it. So the commission has a really duty to fund an enormous amount of events and workshops and webinars which the association can spread around. So otherwise the small companies will miss the wave of innovation simply because they will not know where to go. Thank you. Emilia, do you, do you have anything to ask maybe from your perspective and from... Uh, before you give before the floor to, give... to Emilia, I'm told that uh, Emilia's mic can, audio can be heard very well from the people online, but here in the room it's a bit low. 
your, your audio, Emilia. So if you, when you answer your Medicina's question, if you can speak as loud as possible, only for the few people who are here in the room with us, basically the speakers and, and a couple of guests. You go for the question then. Emilia, from your perspective, from your perspective, so I would like to know what's digital sovereignty then for you and how do you see your SMEs and other SMEs role in that? So same question we looked a bit together with Isabella. Sure, thank you for giving the floor. Uh, can you hear me well now? Mm, so, so. You are still quite low, uh, low in volume, so the, the, the louder you can, you can make yourself, your voice, the better. Okay. Apologies, uh, due to COVID, my voice is getting really low, so <laughs> that could be, but I will try, I'll do my, my best. So for digital sovereignty, what I can uh, mention is that uh, we have for AI, as it was already mentioned by Isabel, we start with data, but there is an entire value chain. The value chain in includes hardware and software alike. SMEs really rarely can cover the entire AI value chain from hardware to the end user. And that is this uh, frame to digital sovereignty. Because if we would want to have solutions which are completely made in Europe, then we need to cover all these pieces. So I think the digital you know, sovereignty strategy is really important. Uh, supporting all the small pieces of the value chain enables SMEs to find the right partner and be able to apply operationally digital sovereignty in practice. As Isabel mentioned, there are some initiatives possible. There are already some initiatives existing, like at the European level, we have the AI for Euro platform, which enables through a login and uh, with a secured account to have access to specific experiments and APIs. This, there are steps. We know that this will take time. But in the same time, industry evolves and standardization in, par in parallel develop. So being present in both the operational side, being present, for example, on the European platforms and on the market and also on standardization, it is a challenge. So for an SME to have uh, to be part and to participate, uh, to support the digital sovereignty, especially in standardization, this requires support. But what we find is relevant from our perspective, as we provide only software for wearable devices, is to have uh, all the actors of the AI value chain, which are supported through the strategy. So I would think uh, for a small company, the ability to find partners, European-based, it is key. Thank you. And what does it mean for you? If there are all these partners, if there are opportunities, what does this digital sovereignty would bring for you, for businesses, for all SMEs in Europe? What do you think would change? Why is it important? Why is this an opportunity to, to be taken? I think from my perspective, uh, from our solution perspective, this changes the fact that we can offer to European clients yeah. a solution fully made in Europe with all the trust which comes with it. We are dependent on tech manufacturers, hardware manufacturers. When we find partners in Europe, we can provide that. And this is not an easy game to play yet. Mm. Do you think, and this question perhaps to both of you, do you think making this step and ensuring more, we can probably never say, okay, this is full sovereignty, this is partial sovereignty, but moving towards achieving digital sovereignty, does it also mean that this could place us in the global competition on global level, this SME-led Europe as a very, very competitive and big globally more recognized player in all the digital fields? Please, uh, Isabella, you can start. Something, thank you. I think we have something really special in Europe that very few other parts of the world have. We don't just have the small medium enterprises. We have a huge number of citizens, which makes our market the most attractive in the world for the next digital economy wave of innovation. So we shouldn't be forgetting about the combination of SMEs in the economic structure and the people and the purchase power of the people. We're also talking about 
solutions that are going to be used by people, solutions that are going to be used by public administration, and solutions that are going to be used by small medium enterprises as much as by the large. Let's not forget that in California, one of the best places where actually you can raise money if you are a startupper and you want to introduce a new technology that maybe no one is interested in, but the venture capitalists always find it interesting enough to fund it, it's if you're going direct into the enterprise's software because your first target of customers is the companies around you that will need that solution to spend less for doing the same thing. This is a little bit missing in Europe, okay? We don't have that, but we have 500 plus million consumers. So we should not be forgetting that data are produced by people. They're generated by people and the value associated with the data, it's coming from people. So the marriage, the bundle that Europe can make between the amount of data we create and the value of those data within the system of the SMEs, it's special, it's unique, it's what can really make the difference over time. Of course, there will always be the large giants fighting for their own standards about interoperability and data portability and data sharing. And I really would like to draw the attentions of everyone in the room that this is a little bit of an area of concern for SMEs. Everybody talks in IT about interoperability. Everybody knows what it is, right? Interoperability doesn't mean data portability. But GDPR talks about data portability and the Digital uh, Data Governance Act talked about, talks about portability. Data Act talks about portability. So we should first very quickly look into standardizing the lexicon, the glossary, the labeling, because all this will be part of the framework on which companies can then build a business. For example, imagine yourself, you're a small company, you're interested in some automotive industry data. And everybody knows about the data exchange, big initiative the Germans have put together called Catena X. Catena X is a very well-structured, advanced initiative, a little bit German, but very, very well-structured, to go possibly into the federation of Gaia X, maybe not, maybe yes, they're still discussing the how to do it. But if you are a small component manufacturer of just one electronic piece of the future connected electrical car that is not in the BMW, Volkswagen world or Peugeot, how the hell do you gonna get the data you need if you really wanna be testing your component before you go and sell it to the large automotive industry you're seeking to have your ideal customer for it? The only way is actually going back to the, what I said before, you need to have a catalog, you need to have the data, you need to be importing those data. So who can give you those data? There are two originating data suppliers, one, the enterprises and two, the consumers. And we should just be thinking very creatively about the, what the power could be if the data intermediaries that the European Commission has invented as a new entity, but no one has yet decided whether they want to be or not to be a data intermediary. It's capable to aggregate and coordinate a, a huge amount of data that otherwise would be locked into the domain of SMEs. So let's think creatively. Data can be supplied by large enterprises because there will be some regulation of asymmetries that will probably apply to the fact that they have to open their databases. But data can also be supplied directly by the users if the users are coordinated and if standards are developed in that space. And I think perhaps we need both. Do you agree with this? We need also force the manufacturers in the way to open up the data for SMEs because I agree with what you are saying that if you can get consumers into this, and I think European consumers are indeed becoming more and more conscious about it, uh, we are getting educated, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but should we act on both? Well, I, I, I always like giving examples because it, it, it serves to open minds and I hope it's, I'm going to be enough provocative to get questions after that. But um, I think everybody can acknowledge that Tesla has made beautiful cars and they are very well working and, and, and elegant. And uh, we in, this, in the IT domain, we call them a computer with four wheels. It's not really a car. I mean, it's not the car the way we thought to be in the past. And the data that are contained in a Tesla car are fantastic. I cannot tell you how much they're interesting for a lot of stakeholders. And at the moment, they're locked into the Tesla box and it's very difficult to get them out. 
On the other side, we also have very nice, beautiful Amer um, European electrical cars that are getting into the market that are a lot more elegant than the Tesla and a lot more beautiful than the Tesla, but they're a little bit less efficient on the computing side, but they will be there because hopefully there are companies like Qualcomm that comes and open you know, the market with an horizontal approach to give the, the, the computing power to the car that is necessary to collect and process the data at the car level with a more open system than the other system that is used by the Tesla, which is good because it's opening opportunities. A little bit like Apple and Android in the old times, you know, open system, closed system. Yeah, but there is a fantastic situation that has changed over time that until yesterday and before the digital sovereignty, everybody in the car space would say the car belonged to the car maker. Now the game is over. The data needs to be allowed it to be collected for a purpose, but the data are owned by someone else. So imagine how powerful it can be for all the drivers of the electrical vehicles to allocate on a very significant open bidding system to whoever is interested in the market, the car collected with their device. Okay, the device is a computer with four wheels, but it's not different from a smartphone. So both directions we need yes. to go. I, I fully agree, I think it's... Uh... It's one of the points that we hear quite often from our companies, but we believe that it still should uh, reach the wider audiences. And I think with your beautiful examples, <laughs> this is very, very helpful. Uh, Emilia, do you have anything to, um, to react to this? I think uh, on this, uh, on the data aspects, what is relevant has been said. And the relevant actions which are proposed by Isabel, they remain the most efficient that we could uh, have on the market. Then you are mentioning the European dimension. How can we reinforce the European dimension? Uh, many think that legislation is a frame to uh, innovation and it can be a frame to change. But what is uh, uh, largely um, misregarded is the part that when you provide a label of trust, like a certification, conformity assessment, you do not uh, assess only trustworthiness of those uh, products, services, uh, which are on the market, but you assess also the quality, the performance of those products. So having in Europe the only, the first test beds, which are able to certify which AI products, for example, are the best in terms not only of trustworthiness, that they are trustworthy from the user perspective, but also on, in terms of quality and performance, that could attract the top-notch technology also in Europe and can make Europe, through its SMEs, which make it resilient, more than 90% are SMEs, so many actors, a lot of diversity. We do not have only one actor, which will be a competition. Uh, then you can attract the top-notch uh, AI results to be developed first in Europe and then go outside. And that will become Europe resilient from the fact that you have a distributed model where many SMEs develop AI solutions and they can keep their competitiveness because also large or medium actors and outside actors would like to be part of this effort. And this relies on a unique model. Europe has this unique model of being SME based. Its economy is based on SMEs. And if one or two are struggling, the others can support. It's not a large effect. And I do think that, for example, what we are doing currently in standardization, because I'm more on the standardization side, on conformity assessment, is highly relevant. It's the first time internationally that we define operationally to test an air solution and to say it is conformed to these standards. And also what we are developing is risk catalogs. This was not, never done. At international level, risk is largely ignored or it's not given a lot of bandwidth by our development. What we have now in European standards and what we are preparing for different research centers and not only standards, not only standardization initiatives, is preparing testing for quality, trustworthiness, performance. Will Europe play a key role? It really started playing a key role there. And we are trying to put those initiatives at the European level. But of course, we need more SMEs to be present and give their feedback. Thank you. And I think these are also already some good examples. You mentioned how really SME-led um, 
uh, European digital sovereignty is going towards actually the global lead and positioning us globally with solutions that have have not been seen before on a global stage, right? Yes. Uh, uh, actually, international standardization exists in artificial intelligence since 2018. In Europe, we started with a focus group on AI in 2020, so later. But we focus on the important aspects. As we do not have a lot of resources, we focus on what is operationally viable and what will really support the market and the economy thrive, not only one or two actors. So yes, I do think Europe takes, can take the lead and Europe is already doing the main uh, steps there. And this is also thanks to the SBS support because without that, no SME would uh, participate or allocate this amount of time uh, to be part of the standards. Please, sure. Um, it, it is true that for some initiatives in standardization, the international component on a timeline has started earlier than we did. But they did, in my opinion, uh, I, I want to see if Emilia agrees or disagrees with me. On AI, the depth of what we're doing in Europe, it's, I would say, significant compared to the diluted depth of the, what is done at the international level. And I, I would also say that from a, from a competition, competitive landscape standpoint, Europe has a significant advantage on having defined its GDPR framework much earlier than anyone else and having gone into the nightmare of understanding the intrinsicacies of the interplay between privacy and competition. And, and Europe has a crystal clear idea now as how to possibly use GDPR as a golden standard in other parts of the world, which will open a very, very important standardization path driven by Europe in international domain, where I really see that Europe has an advantage. Now, it all depends on whether we're going to be grappling the advantage, but the advantage, I mean, the momentum is there. And if, if that is shaped in the, in the technical implementation of it, which is what actually goes back to my point of, uh, of commenting my reactions to what the standardization policy initiatives of the commissions are in the specific of the data sharing environment, because Privacy is about protecting your data. Sharing is about sharing your data. So it's like if we look at the mirrors on two sides, you share or you protect. But that how you define that equation from a, from a policy and an economic um, angle, it's really going to impact the productivity of Europe and our ability to growth in terms of employment and in terms of patents and in terms of opportunities of scaling our solutions outside Europe. So I love the idea to have digital sovereignty because it's a little bit the idea to have a kind of an internal market that it's big enough to suffice to itself, but we have to fight for taking out of Europe our standards and have this being built on something that is really solid. Sometimes I see a little bit, you see, we, I will read the newspapers, we SMEs, we cannot participate in all the working groups of the world that deal with it, but we see the tension between the political environment and, and, and the administrative environment and the judicial environment as whether or not it's important to give to the people the right to decide what to do with their data. And this is a foundation of the economy. Either we decide that the people have a right to say it or they don't. In China, they decided they don't. And then in the US, they are deciding whether or not it is going to be that. In Europe, we decided it matters. So I think that it's pretty strong as convergence into the what we want to achieve. I mean, I wanted to remind the audience that if you have any questions, we can write them down in the chat. So wherever we are following our event today, please just uh, write it down there and my colleagues will uh, help us to, to ask it from our speakers. Uh, meanwhile, because these are very, very interesting ideas, Isabella. But you know, all the, all, all the time today we are saying, okay, if there is something and if we can do this, then we can, we can achieve it, we can get there. So. I would like to tackle because some of the things are were already mentioned here and there, but try, let's try to concentrate them at, at least a bit into the bullet points so that it becomes clear for everyone who is listening to us today. So what should be done there? What exact concrete steps different stakeholders, including decision makers, including commission, but all the other stakeholders, us as association, SBS, right, all of us, what should be done there to, to help us SMEs, to perhaps also to educate consumers? Like what should be the main step? Recommendations from your side. 
Well, this is a, I don't have it's, the answers for everything. I, I know. I can, I can give some points because I'm an SME. I am an SME myself. I'm trying to fit into this. I'm trying to fit into the space as an SME because we lack the resources we would want to be everywhere and be able to be voiced everywhere. So first of all, we join associations like SME <laughs> Digital Alliance because we believe in the strength of being coordinated through an umbrella. Second, we join organizations like GAIA-X as members and we send experts because you need to bridge this thing, the voice of the what you want to do and the technicality of the how you want to do it. And then, you convince the European Commission as an SME through the association that they need to fund the expertise to go to the standard organization. That, that is the fundamental equation. In the specific of the data sharing and data economy wide topic, I don't want to be suggesting we have to pick up a winner, but we have to pick a winner in the way we build the trust framework to exchange data in Europe. So I offer to everyone to look into what exists in the market. There are two, three initiatives. If you have the resources to go into the three, go into the three, or just pick the one that you feel it's going to be the stronger for your particular need, but go. Go or get represented by someone, because at this moment I speak, there are working groups that are defining the connectors between the databases, the credentials authentication system, the interoperability protocol to exchange data. This is technical implementation. If you're not at the table, you're not going to be able to participate into this. And on the other side, the legal side of it. So I know it's a pain, <laughs> but um, at the end, data exchange, data sharing, data economy means contractual clauses, means contract. So we don't want to leave again this to the market to have standard clauses that are not standard and then they forget about the principle of laws that we want in Europe and we believe these are values. So my invite is to the association of which I'm a member to make a strong voice with the European Commission that all the expert groups and all the task force that have been announced and, 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 and set to look at the clauses to make these exchanges happening get formalized and get going because we need deliverables and they need to match with the technical specifications that are discussed in the industry bodies and then maybe referenced into the standards bodies. We indeed know that there is a bit of work already starting from the Commission side, but uh, <laughs> we will definitely try to also keep an eye on this, uh, also with our task for data. So there is definitely some work we are following yes. on that. That's perfect. Amelia, we are getting back to you. Do you have your secret recipe coming from your side? So what should all the stakeholders do? What should happen to help us and to lead European digital sovereignty and position us globally? I think one important step was already done by the creation of the European Digital SME Alliance, which is not only uh, supported by the European Commission um, on the politic policy uh, side, but also on the scientific side, which is the technical side for the GRC collaboration. This, I think, it is the most important point. Then uh, we hear a lot uh, in standardization, and not only, um, SMEs would like this, but they are, uh, we should do this kind of initiative because we'll benefit SMEs. You know, in standardization, we have this kind of forms. And in these forms, you will mark who will benefit from this. And I think by default, every time it's marked, SMEs will benefit. Nobody asked SMEs. So I would think at the policy level, what it should be reinforced, and it's not only at the policy, but also standardization level. There should be guidelines saying that if we check box these SMEs, did we ask European Digital SME Alliance? Did we ask SBS whether they agree or not with this? Did they get their feedback from the members? Because this is never the case. So I think pragmatically, when uh, there is a representation of SMEs, it should pass for an official representative uh, and the proper organization should be consulted at least. So it should not be accepted in standardization or in policy making that this will benefit SMEs unless there is solid proof, material proof, uh, that SMEs are represented. And this comes also in many other different aspects. 
uh, being at uh, European actions, which are European funding. But this uh, you will know better than I do because you cover many European projects and you know uh, the functioning. But is it always the case that projects which should benefit SMEs have SMEs involved? And this is, I think, something which is ongoing to ensure that when a project is intended to support the SME uh, outtake on the market or they're bound with uh, research or industry, they need to be represented and not only by one or two companies. If it is myself with my company, which are really a small entity, uh, that's not representative for all the SMEs. This needs consultation and feedback for many members. And we should take advantage for, from the fact that the European Digital SME Alliance has more than 45,000 members. That's amazing. I do not know another organization in Europe or worldwide which has this kind of uh, numbers and representatives. Yes, I think this would be uh, concrete actions to ensure through guidelines a standardization at uh, European funding, ensure that SMEs are represented and not only by one or two uh, episodic representations. Thank you. So increasing SME presentation and especially strengthening the stakeholders representing SMEs, that's my main take if I would need to summarize it. Perfect. And then if you don't have any other questions from the audience, I know when we speak of digital sovereignty, there is always this elephant in the room, most likely coming not from SME community, but uh, we hear it every now and then about the protectionism of Europe when we speak of European sovereignty, uh, right? What's, uh, what's the right balance and is Europe really trying to be protectionist now or is it a bit of an argument that is just throwing a little stone into a used garden without much of a real argument behind it. So would you like to comment on that? I love to. Perfect. <laughs> well, you know, I think it was a shock for the world, realizing that when we passed the GDPR, we applied the principle of inter international jurisdictional effect. I mean, for, for the world, having a norm adopted in Europe that applies elsewhere, it's something that it drove a lot of countries really sick. Um, so I see that as the beginning of the digital serenity. Then came what came after, that is the surrounding needed changes to the regulation because we needed to look at content and we needed to look at uh, the infrastructure and we needed to look at the funding of the infrastructure. Europe is not protectionist. Europe is very aggressively open trading now on this matters. So I would invite all the commentators to really look into what this digital sovereignty policy is. This is about bringing the European standards everywhere, and it's not easy. It's not closing the European borders to make it as we like it in our domain. Uh, so I, I, I really, I'd say, uh, disconnect with those who say we're protectionist. At the same time, there are some industries in Europe that lobby the Commission and the Council and the Parliament because they are protectionist for their, their own industries. And we know very well which they are. And I think that it's completely um, outplaced and they're going to not win because simply they're asking unreasonable things. But in broader term, uh, we are a, a very vibrant economy with lots of fragmented solution, fragmented situation to solve, including the how we're going to be exchanging data within ourselves, between the public and the private, between the small and the big companies, between consumers and enterprises. But we've got a little bit of a recipe ahead of us, and it's sitting on deep, deep value on the why it's important that we protect those values while we implement the new system. So. I'll be always claiming that we're not protectionist and we're doing it in the right way. I very much agree, so. <laughs> uh, Emilia, do you have something to add? Because I also think there is somebody in the audience with a short question. Um, just a short comment. I think Europe is not protectionist, is providing the right tools for a great foundation. So now Europe is shaping concrete tools, clear tools, uh, removing uncertainty, where can we uh, develop AI technologies and to have it for a uh, long run, not only for 
uh, short periods with a lot of risks which are not handled. So I think it is not a protectionist uh, uh, policy. It is a policy which enables trust and it enables resilience on the long run. Thank you. Not protectionist, but enabling. <laughs> Thank you, Emilia. Um, I see my colleagues are trying to give the floor to one of our reviewers today, Mr. Donato Rousseau. Can, can we hear his question? Yes? Yes? Donato, please uh, tell us. Oh, we see you. We can't hear you. Please unmute yourself. Yes. You are yes. right. You are right. Thank you very much and for this great, great opportunity to share thoughts with such a competent panel. Well, you know, um, uh, speaking about a vibrant SME ecosystem, I think we should, uh, we should consider the possibility of blockchain technology. And, um, you know, there are several ways to use blockchain technologies. Um, I have been listening to the aspects of, the, you know, the sovereign identity. I have been uh, listening to the data privacy. I have been listening to GDPR and legal aspects. You know, mm, I think blockchain, sustainable blockchain, could really help us solving very ma many problems if this blockchain, as an example, would be adopted by all the members of the EU Digital SME Alliance uh, by the creation of a so-called DAO, uh, a decentralized autonomous organization, which is a highly democratic tool uh, where the governance is decided by the participants and where all the participants then can solve a lot of the, the problems which have been. Thank you, Donato. I think we have him stuck. Uh, so <laughs> thank you very much. I think we understood the point. Uh, besides, we spoke about data today, about uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So we also have another technology here in the debate, blockchain. And clearly, we know that it's another area of standardization is also really needed. And there is a lot of work to be done and a lot of uh, su support is needed to have more European experts in uh, blockchain standardization. So we are very much working on that in SBS and we know that there will be another um, project supported by the Commission in the area. Uh, I don't know if uh, it probably was more a statement rather than a question, but do speakers agree? Another technology will be, which could help to position Europeans? Um. I would say that I, I take the point and uh, it's a strong advocacy for blockchain. Um, I've been at technologies for many, many years working for a lot of big companies that each one said that their own technology was better than the other. I'm a pusher for technology neutrality, okay? Whether you want to be implementing centralized or decentralized, that's the market to the side. We shouldn't be prescribing any one of the two. And maybe tomorrow we're going to be waking up and there's a third, okay? I really hope so. So... Um, even blockchain in itself does not solve all the problems of who owns the data and who values the data and who measures the value of the data and how do we grab the value of the data, which are tremendous need of, you know, we need building indicators of that to be able to create an economy of data. And today it's not, it's not measurable. So it's not just by saying that it's centralized or decentralized that we solve the problems of the, how we run the economics of data. That, that's my view. Thank you, Isabella. Emilia, do you want to add anything on this? Otherwise, we will be jumping to closing remarks, unfortunately, as much as I had fun with you today. Uh, so, Emilia, would you like to conclude a little bit from uh, your side? Sure, I think it was a great exchange. As we could see, there are many technologies which can be used as the blockchain or others. Even AI can be used in order to improve governance and in order to improve processes. So all these technologies, they benefit the society and they benefit SMEs. Uh, I think we saw there is a, a clear openness to support SMEs. That was the opening speech. And we saw a clear need to have inclusiveness of SMEs in all decision processes and the establishing standards. And we are on the good path. Of course, now it needs only to be done. You know, it is only the start. There is a goodwill, but this needs to be transposed in concrete measures. And this goodwill, it will need to be to back up uh, by concrete um, actions. 
So looking forward for that. Thank you, Amelia. Isabella, would you like to add something for concluding remarks? Um, if, if we had the representative of the Digi Growth still sitting with us, I would say that he made a very good point that the lack of resources, which may be human or, or financial for, for SMEs, is one of the blocking factors for participating more actively in standardization. Okay, So I'm not asking the European Commission to start flooding SMEs with more money than they're already doing, but there is one bottleneck that actually the, the big... Um, organizations, industry-driven organization that emerged from the digital sovereign policy. You know, one to name is Guy X, but there are others. They cost. If you want to be a member, it cost. And if you are an SME, that cost is still high. So they could consider either uh, allocating more resources to the SBS alliances or to associations that allows representative from more SMEs to be part of those organizations, because otherwise it's a little bit difficult for for matching that um, that requirement. Very interesting, and I'm sure we will take it on board anyway with conclusions with the event that will also be shared with colleagues that unfortunately could not stay till the end. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isabella. Thank you, Emilia. Thank you so much. And I give floor back to Sebastiano before we hit the break. Well, thank you. I'm just We break for 10 minutes and we, we start at uh, half past 10, uh, both those who are here and those who are joining online. In the meantime, we set up the new session. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm glad to have with me uh, Emilio Davida uh, Gonzalez, who represents uh, the European Commission, DG Connect. He's the head of sector capacity standardization. Uh, I have, uh, uh, then I have Sen Senelec uh, with uh, Constant Kohler, who's the uh, account manager for, for ICT. And, uh, and I have uh, Margot Dorr, who represents uh, Etsy as the uh, dire director for government, government affairs. Um, so uh, to start with, uh, perhaps we have heard from, from the commission earlier. So I'd like to start with the ESOs, the European Standards Organizations, uh, perhaps a constant with the with Sen and Senelec. So, uh, you know, in, in a couple of minutes, uh, uh, what is your take on, on the topic, uh, on the tables, on digital sovereignty? What, is Sen what are Sen and Senelec doing uh, in terms of standardization in that respect? Thank you, Sebastiano, and, and good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for us for, for the invitation and to the previous speakers. It was very interesting, I, I must admit. So I hope we will continue uh, in the same direction. So um, I really like what uh, Isabella actually mentioned about uh, digital sovereignty from, uh, from uh, a direction to the implementation. I think that uh, in terms of direction, we, we, we still need to conduct this kind of discussion, this kind of forum to, to shape a common understanding of what it means, actually, digital sovereignty, what it means for public institutions, what it means for the enterprises, for SMEs, uh, but also for, for citizens and, and consumers uh, uh, at the end. So um, that's very interesting to, to continue to, to shape this dialogue like we are doing today. And, and by the way, this is also something that we are doing in, in Sense and Lake, trying to further define this concept with the launch of a specific uh, workshop uh, agreement that aims at defining uh, the, the concept, uh, what are the implications on standardization, can it lead to, to more harmonization at the end uh, in Europe, at European, at European level, at international level, would it lead to more fragmentation, which is obviously something that we don't want. Uh, so, um, and yeah, how to bring together different perspectives about digital sovereignty into common standards, uh, as I will say. Um, also, then, that's the direction, but when we talk about implementation, uh, activities have already started in that respect. Um, we have talked about uh, AI standardization, as it was mentioned, the International Committee was set up before the European one. But on the other end, we have a, a draft standardization request on, on the table, which is already driving the direction uh, for standards in the interest of the, the economic actors, giving us the opportunity also to uh, once European standards are available to, to influence the standards development at international level, but also for those topics where there's for the time being no technical committees, and I'm notably thinking about quantum technologies, which is something on, on, on the radar that is uh, coming up very soon, for which we may have a, a technical committee in Europe, and that will be the, the first technical committee available in the, the world on this topic. So again, an opportunity for for Europe to, to shape uh, that uh, that direction. So yeah, that would be my introductory uh, element. Thank you. Thank you, Constant. Um, and then the next, I would like to introduce Margot Dor, Margot from, from Etsy. So what will be your you know initial initial statement to open up this uh, this conversation? Uh, thank you very much for having me and for having Etsy. Can you hear me all right first? We hear you loud and clear. Very good. Uh, very good morning to everybody. Um, it is an interesting conversation, uh, if for one thing is that I heard in uh, Mr. Kuzigu using indifferently the term uh, digital sovereignty and strategic autonomy, etc. And as far as I'm concerned, as far as we're concerned, um, I think the term strategic autonomy is probably more actionable than that of digital sovereignty. Uh, digital sovereignty remains seems to be a little bit of a, a, an absolute we're trying to attain, whereas strategic autonomy is very um, uh, operationable, if I may say, uh, implies that we define concrete objectives, and I think this is what we're all busy doing, uh, both the Commission from the, uh, from the uh, policy and legislation side, um, ESOs, etc. It implies also strategic choices. Um, Europe cannot be sovereign. I mean, what means sovereign today? We saw what's happening in the energy networks and things like this. So we need to be autonomous. I think this is this is much more powerful a, a policy direction, which means you make choices. 
and you make choices in, in domains where you have the industry to back it. Because something else I heard Mr. Mr. Kozigo say is that standards are technical matters made by experts in support of legislation. Well, yes, but <laughs> yes, it's also very political matters made by experts in support of market and industry and, and users and market development. So you need also to have the uh, industrial fabric behind, et cetera. So we are busy doing this. We are um, um, working on, on different components of the different uh, uh, policy dimensions that the Europe, that EU is indicating, but also under the, uh, um, how can I say, with the energy of all the membership. And as you know, Etsy is busy doing both uh, standards in support of policy and legislation, standards in support of well, global standards with less uh, connection to regulatory purpose. And, um, and uh, that would be my introductory remark. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Margot. I think it was uh, loud and clear. Um, Perhaps then, with, after these two uh, two notes from from yourselves, uh, I'll go to to Emilio to to hear if he has from the Commission side, from the G Connect, any immediate reactions to what what you said, and if he wants to start with his own considerations. Yeah, thank you, Sebastiano, and, and thank you for inviting me. I'm enjoying a lot the, the discussion, and you know that the SMEs get to my heart. I started working for a Spanish association of high tech SMEs, and my first work in the Commission was to support the SMEs research program. So uh, I really um, care about these issues. I think that it's clear that technical standardization plays a role to support uh, uh, EU digital sovereignty and. Uh, autonomy, uh, and this is the reason of the standardization strategy. But my time, I was referring in introduction to the importance of issues, and this was confirmed by Isabel, by Isabella, and by the way, I enjoyed a lot of your, your interventions, uh, the importance, for instance, to access to data and to ensure fair competition. And this is why, from the Commission, we have put on the table a series of proposals, like the Data Act, like the DSA or DMA, the, 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 the proposal on artificial intelligence as well, trying to propose a, a regulatory framework. We are the first region that is proposing a regulatory framework for the platforms trying to ensure fair competitions, for instance. But to support the objectives of this regulation, and of course, I think back by, by the industry, because we have heard uh, in the previous intervention that the backing of the industry in many things, uh, we need to have the right standards. And we were talking about examples, and this reminds me of all the discussion we had already with automotive manufacturers. At the moment, the uh, small workshops wanted to make maintenance and get access to the vehicle data. And the vehicle manufacturer was say, oh, this is that very dangerous because if someone else is entering into my data, oh my God, what can be happens? Well, not. How this was solved? Via standard, the onboard equipment. And then via this interface, then the, the small workshop, which are SMEs, by the way, they have access now to, to this data. So this is what we need to have good standards in order to support our policies. And the way to ensure that EU values are respected is just to support the participation of uh, EU experts. We need to be a standard set and we need to promote our standardization approach, our standards internationally, uh, our values. And we need to support the participation of the, of the EU experts. And in particular for SMEs, because you have the innovation. I mean, this is clear, no discussion. SMEs uh, in Europe are in particular the innovative uh, uh, engine. And it's true, you were mentioning that, uh, Isabella, before. Sometimes you see in a standardization, and we know some example in particular, one is about societal issues, like it could be uh, data privacy, GDPR-related issues, that companies, big companies, tend to defend their position under the status quo. While SMEs or users, then they come here with a more innovative proposal. So let's try to support this. Okay, Emilio, I'd like to perhaps continue with you based on what you said uh, and what I heard earlier from, from your director, Mr. Kozigu, uh, not your director, <laughs> not your director boss, but uh, a director in, in the commission indeed. Um, what is your opinion about uh, uh, the uptake of uh, no regulatory standards? Uh, standards that are actually important for, for, for our companies to uh, leader new technologies and also to adopt uh, technologies. 
<coughs> such as such as IoT, uh, because I heard that uh, one key ingredient in the equation is, of course, the Commission cannot mandate, cannot oblige the member states uh, to uh, to impose central standards, especially in public procurement, because public procurement remains a, a, a decision uh, by the national authorities. Um, so, in order to have this public-private partnership work really in a strategic way for the interest of Europe in view of also digital sovereignty or uh, strategic autonomy. Um, what can be done there? Um, let's, let's hear, do you mm -hmm. have any ideas of your own uh, what we could do to, to do something more? Because may, I hear many companies say, mm, we are not doing enough. We could be doing more. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. So to precise that uh, when uh, Cosiglu is not my director, but in any case, we have a lot of relations with colleagues of DigiGrow and other community services, and uh, it's like it should be. Anyhow, you have a good question, and it's true. The standards are market driven, they are bottom up, but uh, I think we, we can and we should, in particular when we see that this is beneficial for either the, the citizens, the consumers, the market or to support the policies, uh, and, and Margot, I agree with you, it's market-driven, but uh, if this works in the right direction, market and EU policies should go hand by hand. I mean, it's our interest to have uh, to support uh, the EU industry, and for that it's our interest that the EU industry have the best standards and they can go and uh, uh, be introduced uh, in other markets, even beyond the 27 plus 3 markets. And in particular in the digital, we need global standards and we need uh, uh, that uh, allows, for instance, companies from Europe going to India, and then the, if they are experienced uh, with the uh, Internet of Things, they can go there and sell the products much more easily than if we don't have this global standards. So if we have this situation, what can we do? And there are things, and we are we are already doing that. When we are talking, for instance, about 1M2M or IoT standards, we have been promoted through all our research projects, and not only the research projects, but with our pilot and demonstrations that this preliminary standards are brought into real life situations so everybody could see the benefit of having the standards deployed. We need to do more with uh, the, the PPPs, the, the private and public partnership, where all the stakeholders are present. For IoT, we have the Alliance of Internet of Things Innovation that was promoted and launched by the Commission, and then now is a they have the standardization working group, and then they have how to apply this solution into the different vertical sectors. For instance, you were mentioning 1 and 2M, and the, the good example is smart cities. And there, there is a lot of discussion there with the Open, Ally, Open uh, and Agile Smart Cities initiative, how to incorporate the 1M2M standards with open source solutions, with the firmware, developing APIs, with all the standards that were developing about context information management in Etsy, with all the standards that have been developed regarding IoT in SenseNLEC or ISO IEC, how to make all together and then maybe using the 1M2M middleware platforms in order to have all the pieces of the glue. And another important thing is, is the public procurement. I mean, we can do more. It's true, it's a national activity, but we have seen the benefits of using uh, open standards and we need to make uh, uh, more awareness about that for public authorities. If you are using open standards, an implementer can develop their applications with those standards that are referenced in public procurement. Otherwise, a, SMEs have more difficulties to get access to that, and B, the public authorities may be locked into okay. a specific solution for a big company, and then good luck when you have to renegotiate the maintenance of the process of the next generation. Yeah. Uh, and we have seen that. We have a, 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 a also a, a set of measures regarding public procurement and innovation, where we try to reference open standards rather than uh, having uh, proprietary solutions, but that the way in theory, are not authorized to be uh, included in uh, in public procurement. So, whilst standards can be referenced like such in public procurement, to many many different measures, many different things. Uh, it makes me also think of something I didn't foresee to to to, to mention here. But uh, uh, there is an interesting initiative by the Digital SME Alliance, which is called Focus Group on Smart Communities, where 
we have put together the SMEs with the city representatives. Uh, there is, for instance, EuroCity, but there is also the European Commission, and they have produced a manifesto which talks about the role of uh, public procurement with a vision on uh, also on, on the development of SMEs and with the vision on you know, avoiding the lock-in, using open standards, and selecting the suppliers also based on you know these strategic considerations. Uh, so I, I invite all of you to you know uh, look for for it in our website. It's called Smart Focus Group on Smart Communities, and there is a manifesto they published some months ago. Um, uh, I'd like to ask the other two the other two panelists here from from Sensen and, and, and Etsy. What do you think about this? Especially, I will start with Margot. Are you happy with uh, what you heard from, from Emilio? Uh, are you satisfied with the level of support uh, you are getting from, from the Commission in terms of public-private partnership? Uh, if, uh, because, of course, some of your international standards for those where Etsy has contributed, no, no, not only 1M2M, but there's also 3GPP with you know, the, the, the 5G and so on. Uh, are you getting enough support uh, as an organization to you know, really promote the European interest uh, worldwide with your standards? Thank you very much. First of all, I'm always happy listening to Emilio. That's <laughs> by default. <laughs> By default, this is, uh, this is something that works well. Um, I would like to make a caveat here because he said uh, the market, yes, but also the legislation. And also in the previous panel, Madame de Micheli, she, she very much made the point about big versus small. And I think this is, this, is, this is not right. The market is everybody. The market is, a, is an abstraction. And it is composed of the regulator, the legislator, the industry, the big, the small, the user, the consumers, and so forth and so on. And, and when I say standardization is market driven, I don't mean standardization is corporation driven. I mean market driven, including with the member states, etc. And as you know, in Etsy, everybody is on the same par when it comes to participating. Uh, talking about which in Etsy, there is about 23 um, uh, SME members, so it's it's already a, a good number. And of course, we always try and 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 get more of this. Now, to come back to your question, uh, uh, Sebastian, I think this is the, the the crux of the matter. The crux of the matter. Um, European standardization. I speak for my domain, but the domains, thanks to digitalization, are very much blurred now. There is no more so-called repartition of work between Sense and Lake and Etsy. I guess. Constant might agree with this and will agree with this. Uh, standardization uh, contributed to tremendous success stories since the internal market regulations and everything, including the creation of Etsy, by the way. And standardization has managed to put Europe on the global map of standards making. In And this is why I was talking about choices and strategic autonomy a bit earlier in a proportion which is all, all today bigger than the size of its industry. I know I'm being provocative here, but I think that, that's my point. We have a machinery which puts Europe on the global standards map in a positively disproportionate manner compared to its industry. Therefore, you have to make choices. Which one do you push on and so forth and so on. And I think what we are doing today both the regulator, I know we can expect probably a reform of standardization and so forth and so on. What we need to do today is to make sure that we adapt the machinery to the changing context, because yes, the context is not the same as 20 years ago when globalization was something happy, China joined the WTO, global the supply chains are going to be global and so forth and so on. We see a re-regionalization of the thing. First of all, this is also why I, I don't like the terms of digital sovereignty, because all the regions want to be digitally sovereign and possibly lead. So there, this is a little bit too many leaders. So we need to learn to collaborate and, and do things and do what we're good at. And I think the, the challenge we have and the, the regulator and the SDOs and the industry, et cetera, is to manage to um, have the system that evolves, that adapts to this new context, without throwing away the baby with the bathwater, because standardization is soft power. 
it, it's not only technical a technical matter. This is not true. If somebody who says this has not been into enough standardization meetings, it is soft power. When Europe uh, managed to export and make a national standard in India, the e-accessibility standard, that is sense and like Etsy standard, with bits and pieces of W3C standards in it, this is a tool for soft power, which is which is immense. And we shouldn't, for the wrong reason, with a very vague philosophical objective, etc., try to say, no, this is enough, we're not going to do it that way, we're going to do it ourselves, we're going to be an auto key, and everything is going to be all right. We don't have the industrial fabric to support that. We used to, at least in my domains, we don't have today. So what? how do you benefit from this moment of, let's say, hysteresis, if I may say, between the time that the industry is sort of weakened a bit, and yet we have a very strong standardization machinery to make it, to adapt it to the new context. Making choices on the different sectors, making choices on the different layers in the data economy, the physical layer, the software layer, the semantic layer, and so forth and so on. Where are we good at? What, where do we put resources, etc.? So it's not a question of regulator against industry, big versus small, users against corporation, whatever. It's really a problem that the standardization um, um, community, but the political community, needs to address. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Margot. Uh, <laughs> no, you, you said many, many <laughs> interesting and also maybe provocative things um, that I think we should be reflecting on. But uh, the first person I'd like to, to comment on that is, is, is Constant, if he wants to address the question and also, of course, react to, to what Margot said. Absolutely. Thank you. And yeah, I very much agree with the, the previous statement, actually. And, and, and I think it's really this idea of public-private partnership that is absolutely key because it's the strength of the European standardization system, whether it is for the internal market or whether it's for international consideration. And here we talked previously about those um, regulated areas, those for which there's only, let's say, policies or those areas where there's no regulation and no policies. And I've, actually, it's, it's very important to, to inject this uh, notion of public-private partnership into those three areas. The first one... When we talk, for instance, about uh, harmonized standards, I remember back in the days having really some strong concerns by non-European colleagues about the role of HS consultant, for instance, but with raising awareness on their role, on the fact that it helped making better standards. We can say we, we, we definitely reach an argument with our international colleagues on the added value that he can provide, and also because it's about accessing the European uh, market, and the notion of market access is very important in that respect. When it comes to policies, when there's no regulation, I think that it's also interesting to apply a, a model on the, on the standardization request model, something certainly lighter, but, but at least the European Commission or the agencies like INISA, they put forward objectives, requirements, and so that we can work uh, hand in hand. And last but not least, those areas where there's no regulation or policies, I think that's also the role of the high-level forum for which we are all excited about to, to really detect which are the, the strategic areas, what we, we can do together, and obviously the role of also national standardization bodies, which obviously share common interest. They may have some divergences for economical, historical aspect, but at the end, there's certainly some common ground that can be found to, to be strong at uh, international level as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, unless Emilio wants to, to react, uh, I can go on with the, um, the next question. Okay, Emilio, before I go. Yeah, uh, yeah, just a quick reaction. Um, uh, I, I don't think it's the intention of the Commission to to close the the, the European standardization system to, to to external participation. Uh, if you are in that direction, Margot, no. Uh, I think the intention is that we ensure that uh, European experts are uh, duly represented both in European and international standardization, so they can defend EU values uh, and interest. And then second, regarding um, uh, the, the, the standards, uh, the, the difference between harmonized standards supporting regulation and policy, I fully agree with you. I mean, in many cases, and in particular in the digital sector, in ICT, uh, you need really standards to support interoperability, to support, uh, and we see that uh, standards like uh, those developed for connectivity, uh, they are really important uh, in that area, uh, uh, and they have been a success. 
and, and in the, the majority is not uh, to support the regulation. But they support the EU policies as well, and, and we should there. And where you can find the, these priorities, because now it's true the standardization request refers just to standard supporting regulation. But we have uh, tools like the ICT standardization rolling plan, where you can find for the ICT uh, the needs of uh, identified between the Commission services and stakeholders, including the, the European Standardization Organization, as you know well, <laughs> because you are a member of the task force, and also SMEs who are there, to identify commonly what are the standardization needs to support EU policy. So that would be a, a good uh, tool as well. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Moving on, uh, and back to uh, the representatives of the, of the ESOs. Uh, so in, in, you don't operate in silos, and uh, of course you are part of a global uh, standardization arena. You have your own, uh, you know, uh, cooperation agreements at international level. So how do you, do your organizations uh, contribute to Europe's digital sovereignty or strategic autonomy for, for Margot? Um, what are, you know, what do you do? What are actually your success stories. I mean, we heard from Margot the case of the accessibility in, in, in India, uh, but there are more. Uh, so, uh, Constant, you, you would like to start? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Um, I, I, I would say that it also depends on our capacity to collaborate with different organizations. It's the case with Sense and Etsy, the case with the accessibility. Also, in the context of the Future Data Act, there's a proposal to, to work together with Etsy on the, the topic of our smart contracts. But it's true for other uh, standardization or organization. And when it comes to Senselec, it's primarily, of course, uh, ISO and IC and the role of national standardization body. In that respect, it's true, with, for instance, with cybersecurity, the standards that have been developed, for instance, under the, uh, the ENISA uh, cybersecurity certification schemes, where ENISA developed schemes, uh, um, invited us, not requested, but invited us to develop some standards which then later on were taken up at uh, ISO, IC, GTC1 level. So that's uh, definitely also a success story. We hope it's going to be the same with AI because now we have clear requirement from the Com European Commission to develop standards. We have mechanism then to offer them at international level, uh, which uh, can give uh, yeah, some strong direction for, for Europe at uh, international level. So, um, so yeah, and to see what is coming up with the Data Act, because um, from the annual union work program, it calls for, it, I understand it calls for harmonized standards for interoperability purposes. So I think it's the first time that we would develop harmonized standards for uh, interoperability related uh, goals. So that's going to be also something very interesting and, and, and to see how it's going to be taken up at uh, international level at the end. Yeah. Margot? Well, I, since uh, I, I'd like to come back to what Constant just said to start with, because he mentioned twice the data act. And, uh, and it comes back to your question on support and, and, and talking about harmonized standards. Harmonized standards equates a specific role for the ESO. I guess the audience is aware, is aware of this. I would like to know how the Commission sees the fact that in each and every legislation which has come out lately, Data Act, AI, cyber resilience, etc., it is, yes, we will go for harmonized standards, but should the harmonized standards be insufficient, and God knows what means insufficient in the current context, we are aware of some issues with regard to harmonized standards, we will make a delegated act to go for common technical specifications. And in the, this is one already point. In the data act, there is another subtlety on top of it, which is we will, the commission, uh, make a data act maybe to revise the essential requirements which are in the legislation or complement, or yes, complement, I think is the word. And I think this is talking about public-private partnership, very detrimental to the partnership and to the trust that is needed in this partnership. Because when you start a harmonized standard and you get the industry into motion, the industry, the market, industry, uh, governments, especially in those, in those issues, there is a lot of uh, uh, public actors and so forth and so on. And suddenly you say, uh, yeah, we're gonna make a delegated act, which by the way, according to my knowledge, can only be used if they don't modify the substance of a legislation, passons and you make it via delegated act, you change the essential requirements of the legislation. I mean, what kind of 
how can the market players trust that they should invest, coming back to the investments needed, into standardization in such an iffy regulatory context? I would also like to draw the attention of the audience and get an answer maybe from the commission. What means insufficient? Who decides? when, at what point, with what mechanisms, and so forth and so on. So I'm not, I, Emilio, it's of course nothing against you, et cetera. What I'm saying is that this private-public partnership that we all value, we have said on and on, and trade associations say, and the commission say, and sense like etc say, and everybody is saying, et cetera, is based on trust. And it's based also on the fact that everybody and this is what has been so powerful since the internal market regulation, actually. Everybody was in their lane doing what they're good at. The commission regulates or legislates, etc. Then there is standardization, the harmonized standard, and then there is implementation with presumption of conformity, which, by the way, is a golden tool for SMEs. And now today, it seems there is such a blurring of roles. Am I being too long? I see, <laughs> I see you. <laughs> a blurring of roles that I think this is not the support that the, uh, let's say, the European digital market deserves. I'll stop here because I have a feeling I saw your, your body language and that was okay. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. I mean, you went uh, slightly off topic, but I know that that is a very, very important and highly debated uh, issue. So maybe Emilio could quickly, you know, sh shortly, I would say, try to react to that and then we move, we move ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, before uh, reacting to, to Margot, trying to react, uh, just to mention, uh, I think it, because you were making the question, it is very important to, to leverage on the contacts uh, that you have uh, at international level. And you know that we have been promoting the oh, yes. European approach, oh, yes. our international standards. And it's important, Etsy has a lot of influence. And, and from that, we can bring the European influence in, in, in a global partnership like 3GPP for connectivity, like one and two and from IoT, and sensing all the contacts with uh, through the Vienna and Frankfurt agreement with uh, ISO IC. So this is a way. So that's why we need uh, a, a sustainable, sound, uh, and um, a strong uh, European standardization system. Then, quickly to the question of Bargo, it's just a, I think it's a, a legislative tool. So we are promoting the, the, the new legislative framework in all these uh, uh, new proposals uh, for, for the different acts. Uh, and it's true. We have uh, this backup solution. Why do we have this backup solution? It's because now standards are considered of being quasi low. So it's just a backup solution. We hope not being, not needing to use it. Uh, and we are, as you know, we are talking to you, to send Senele, we are talking to you, to Etsy, we are asking you to coordinate together and to bring with uh, common proposals uh, to address all the standardization needs. And we have been discussing before having the standardization request on how to tackle AI, on how to start dealing with smart contracts. We will come also for the data and uh, for, for, for other issues. And we hope not needing to use it. It's just a, a, a legislative tool, which, by the way, was already in the Web Accessibility Directive. And finally, we didn't use it and uh, you, you develop the harmonized standard, the three ESOs all together, which on top of it was bringing W3C. And you know that that, that was uh, another challenge. So we're in a challenging moment. We are expanding the new legislative framework to issues, and you mentioned like interoperability. We need to work together. We find um, this backup solution, but uh, we hope not. And how to implement it, honestly, should be in a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Okay, I think it is clear that it, it, it remains a backup solution, although it's understood that it creates a little bit of tension. From our point of view, and perhaps I could say, um, what happens if the Commission says inclusiveness, especially of SMEs, is very important in the development of a certain standard? And what happens if, by chance, SMEs are not happy with this new draft standard or they were not participating enough? We heard one SME in the first panel, Emilia, saying, Perhaps we should not adopt a standard if SMEs are, were not present in the, in, the, in the discussion. So knowing that this is an important topic for the Commission, perhaps should the Commission then uh, uh, you know, develop their own standard if, if the ESOs do not comply with uh, their requirements in terms of inclusiveness? I know that this is 
we all know that this is not going to happen, right? This is just an hypothetical scenario. The Commission will never reject the standard because uh, Digital SME or SBS says we don't like it. Uh, we are not that important, but it's good to, to think that it is in principle, in principle, it could be in principle possible. Anyway, uh, we could talk for hours about that, so I would like to, to maybe move, move ahead. Um, talking about inclusiveness, this topic. Um, so, what are San and San like NHC actually doing to make sure really SMEs uh, have a seat on the table and are influential in, in the development of, of new standards, also in view of uh, leveraging their participation for standards that could support the digital sovereignty. A constant. Thank you. Um, yeah, indeed, com coming back to, to the SME question as such. So in Sensenec, we already do have some mechanism for the involvement of SMEs and also for SMEs and especially SBS to, to give some feedback and opinion on, on the standards that are, that are being developed. And actually, in the frame of the Sensenec Strategy 2030, which is very much in line with the EU strategy on standardization, there's a, one action about the inclusiveness and transparency for, for uh, SMEs. So this is a, a project that has started already and for which we hope for some very good uh, outcomes. For instance, we, we could imagine, from my very perspective, that when it comes to harmonized standards, for instance, uh, if there's an issue in terms of compliance for cosmetic issue, if we may say so, but if there's a strong support from SBS or from the SME community, it can help facilitating the process of citation. For instance, this is the, the kind of perspective that we can uh, imagine together. So that would be a first point. The second one, which I think is very important, is in terms of the standards drafting, making available actionable standards for, for, for SMEs, actually, which can be understood very easily and, and for which it's not impossible to navigate within the ocean of, of standards. For instance, it's the case with AI, with the standardization request. There are some elements related to data governance or to cybersecurity, for instance. So it can be very easy to develop multiple standards according to each and different product, but then we will have a, yeah, a, lot, a great number of standards and it can be difficult for SMEs, but instead trying to, to bring all different perspective elements into one single standard with common requirements, this is something that can help SMEs definitely uh, in that respect. So we are also looking into that. And third point that I would like to mention, is not only about the content of the standard, but also about the structure that we put in place to work on some activities. For instance, we are talking obviously about data. What is the best for SMEs having standards being developed in a lot of different technical committees or within one single place that can coordinate with different entities. This is also some kind of configuration that we are discussing and for which it would be great to, to get the input from, from SMEs definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Constant Margot. Would you like to try as well? So, yeah, on the on the, on the specific things that SC does. So as, as I was saying, um, I hear a lot of echo. Is it all right? No, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, there is, uh, as of today, 209 SMEs and MEs members in SC out of 960 something members. Uh, a majority of which in, is in Europe, but not exclusively. And uh, the big thing is that in Etsy, and this is the dif a difference with uh, Sen Senlec, the, the model is direct participation. So um, SMEs, they can join. And when they, when they join Etsy, they have preferential rates to start with in terms of access. And once you're a member of Etsy, it's, it's a, a sort of all-you-can-eat model. So I know if you're an SME, you might have less appetite than than large company, but you, you are in and you can do, uh, you can access all sorts of groups and all sorts of uh, technical committees. Uh, there, are, there are also things we do in terms of visibility. Um, um, for example, we have a magazine in which uh, the, the SMEs have uh, uh, the priority should they want to feature an article or something, etc. So we try and, and be supportive in terms of, uh, in terms of visibility also for the the, the use of Etsy logo and the collaterals and so forth and so on. Now we have also specific programs. If we recently started a so-called board inclusiveness group, board include, the word is not very pretty, but that's what it is, to discuss all those issues 
Um, and, uh, and, and SMEs are more than welcome to bring issues on the table indeed, uh, because this will, be, this will be the measure of the relevance of this group, by the way. Um, we also have something called the 3SI Roundtable, which is specifically tailored for the so-called Annex 3 organizations. Um, and, and again, this is where SMEs and Annex 3 organizations can bring specific issues they want. Uh, there was a lot of discussion of this so-called right of opinion that that uh, uh, Constant mentioned in Sensenec, but it was a little bit different. The problematic was a bit different in Etsy because of the direct membership uh, feature, where you can have a right of opinion at any point uh, um, within the standard making process. And then we have a dedicated meeting in addition to board include, in addition to the three SR roundtable meetings, we now started a, a specific meeting on accessibility at the demand of the 3SI roundtable uh, to discuss this issue. So both from a institutional as well as financial, as well as uh, support when it comes to visibility, et cetera, we're trying to, we're trying to make it easier for the SMEs and, and make them a better experience. And we're always seeking good ideas to make this happen because at the end of the day, no matter how much the SDOs make it easier, there is a question of resource at the other end of the line. If you're a, if you're a company uh, with uh, 10 people, it's true that the marginal cost of sending an expert for a week in a TC is not the same as if you're a corporation, which is why, and I will finish with this, uh, there was a very interesting statistic that I did a while ago that found that for roughly 20, 25% of the SME members, they were putting on the table 40% of the technical contributions in technical committees. And at first I thought I got the math wrong, so I redid it. And in fact, it is right. And the reason why, after talking to many of them, precisely because the marginal cost of sending an expert in a standardization meeting is higher for an SME than for a corporation, when they join, it's because they have something to say. They not necessarily join to attend a network, which is also a big uh, advantage of being in a standard organization, but they join because they want to put a technical contribution on the table. And I think this is a very interesting measure of, of uh, the, the, the importance for the SDOs to have SMEs and for the SMEs to be able to participate. Thank you. Uh, let me ask a quick follow-up question because you call also for concrete uh, uh, concrete initiatives uh, to the two of you uh, would sense and like Enetsi be uh, ready or be, be, be willing to have a transparent budget to be spent on inclusiveness where you know you really tell us what you will do in on inclusiveness and you report year by year okay I have spent so much and I achieved this or that K those KPIs, would that be, is that something that is on the table uh, and could be done or you think this is not possible? Yeah, thank you for, for the idea. I think it's an interesting one, definitely. And, and also beyond that, to, to be able to, to track the different contributions, where they are coming from and for which uh, interest. I don't know um, how many resource intensive for us it will be as well, but definitely something we, we can look at because increasing of transparency is important for for SMEs, for SBS. Uh, it's in the European standardization strategy, also in the sensing strategy 2013. So key principle on which we agree and it can be materialized through the budget as well. Yeah? can see that. Margot. Uh, this is not the way the budget works in Etsy, but I would like to make the same answer as Constant. Interesting idea, and let's, uh, let's discuss it. As I said, there are many different fora where this idea can be brought on the table. Well, I don't know in the case of Sen Senlec because I'm not uh, I'm participating directly, but <laughs> in the case of, of Etsy, this was one of the ideas proposed by all the annex organizations in the GA in, in April. And it is one of those that one of the groups you mentioned, the board INCLU is currently discussing. But I cannot say if there is consensus on that or not. Uh, it's a bit hard to judge. Anyway, um, yes, uh, let me perhaps uh, continue, uh, unless Emilio wants to immediately react to, to what, what he heard. Uh, we are moving to, towards, uh, you know, the, 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 
not 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 there yet but we are quickly move, going to move to the conclusions but before that i wanted to ask everyone in the audience of course to make sure if you have questions you use the chat and i'll try to give you the floor if if there are any uh, any questions in, in the q a um perhaps a question to emilio uh, to follow up a little bit uh, on the international uh, representation of uh, uh, of, of uh, European and international representation of, of SMEs in ICT standardization. Uh, what is actually the Commission doing in terms of providing support? Which schemes are there? Uh, and what do you expect? Uh, we know that is SBS is one of them, which, to which the Commission is also providing financial support to, to the SMEs. Uh, we know there is a stand ICT, uh, another one called HHS Booster. Uh, what is in, in the making? What is happening and what do you expect for, for the future? Yeah, thank you, Sebastiana. But I think it's clear that our position is SMEs to be involved uh, actively uh, in standardization and also startup uh, because this uh, may help them positioning well ahead in the, in the innovation curve when they're developing the products and this also may help them to, to access uh, to new market. So there are many different measures that uh, are either ongoing or envisaged, you mentioned already, support to intermediate associations, because it's clear we cannot reach all the SMEs uh, and possibly nobody. And SMEs is a matter of resources as well. You have all the day-to-day -day business and then uh, intermediate associations can play an important role to approach SMEs, defend their interests, identify specific points or standardization items where SMEs could have a role, keep the database of experts in which they are interested and where they should be involved. All these actions, uh, intermediate associations, and that's why, by the way, we are supporting uh, SBS. But uh, there is also, uh, in the, even in the regulation, there is an article says that foresees concrete measures, uh, measures to ease the access of SMEs to standards, but it's in particular through the national standardization bodies. We are also launching a study there because we see that, of course, the easiest way for SMEs is through the national standardization body. They are closer, they're easy to approach them and there. But uh, uh, we've seen also that there are differences between the different standardization bodies, even in terms of the membership fees that they have to pay. So in some cases, they get a lot of support. In some cases, could even additional burden to participate there. But we need to, to build on, on best practices there. And of course, and the SEOs have been explaining, and you know, we have been pushing a lot of SEO, European standardization organizations to develop measures in favor of uh, SMEs. Then we have all the different uh, research and innovation projects. We are SMEs, as you know, they are a privileged party. Part of the evaluation of these uh, projects is uh, how are SMEs uh, in, involved in these uh, particular proposals. And they are through those processes, uh, through these projects and pilots, they can uh, then bring their contribution into the standardization. There is additional budget there uh, in the Horizon Europe for the research and innovation, but also for coordinator support actions. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned some of them. Stanict.eu, where we fund the direct participation of EU experts in international standardization, including and in particular, and namely from SMEs. And by the way, the, 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 there is a call open now that will end in 7th of November. So if any SME is interested in participating in a particular project uh, or a standardization meeting, please uh, take advantage. We know it's not enough and we need there, but we are trying to make uh, uh, things there. PPPs, public and private partnerships related to our innovation activities. This is another way. We have the 5G PPP in the past, now we have the SNGU, we have the Alliance of Internet of Think Innovation, we have PDBA, Dairo for Data and Artificial Intelligence, we are insisting them on bringing SMEs on board because there, there is a total of discussion of the, of the activities uh, uh, and contributions to standardization. Then we are making a call for researchers and innovators, how within the EU strategy, how they can uh, contribute uh, more into standardization. This could also help innovators from SMEs to, to bring their input there. Implementation, this is important. You, you mentioned that, I think. Guides for implementations, how SMEs can build products and build uh, top on innovations on top of the standards. And there, for instance, the, 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 um, the guides that you made uh, for the cybersecurity, yeah. for SMEs, for security and IT consumers could be a good example, but also participating in hackathons, interoperability, plug test, uh, uh, where SMEs can come, bring the products and see where they are implementing well the standard and receive a further big. 
And uh, something important as well, best practices. I, I think we have to make more awareness. So, Isabella, you are there. There are other cases of SMEs that because of the participation of uh, in standardization, either they got, uh, okay, these are trusted uh, guys, then they have additional investment from uh, financial investors. Or because of uh, being there and being able to participate, they make this networking and they are approached by a big uh, supplier and say, okay, you know this standard, you know this well, we want there, please bring your products and, and be my supplier. Things like that, we, we know about SMEs. We have to make more awareness about the importance of the participation of SMEs. Uh, and I finished there. Uh, and by the way, in a Startup Europe, we were having also this discussion how to bring all the uh, instruments that we have at Startup Europe, innovation rather to identify innovations from the research projects and bring them into standardization and where SMEs are involved. And in Startup Europe, we were discussing that uh, you are mentioning the big platforms that we have there. Now we have the DSM DMA. We believe that the startups uh, could provide for the European uh, input to the platforms in the future in a better regulated framework, so let's do that. And by the way, international cooperation, we need also that the activities that the ESOs are already doing to support uh, the, the participation of SMEs, that this happen also on international level. 3GPP may be more difficult for SMEs to participate, even if now with the hybrid meetings, they have more possibilities. But the same with other, like ISO IEC, where they don't have the same facilities that there. And there, by the way, we are in the in the frame of the TTC Working Group 1 on standardization in our discussions with the uh, American counterparts, uh, also looking into the SMEs and how together we can support more the participation in international standardization and also come together to the governance bodies of international standards in order to ease the participation of SMEs. So a lot of activities that we can do. We also count on you to support us there. And uh, let's, let's work together. Thank you. Uh, thank you. But let me ask you a follow-up question. Because, uh, OK, you mentioned several schemes uh, uh, to support the participation of SMEs. But uh, going back to the topic of today, which is the digital sovereignty, um, Things may not be that simple because, especially when you talk about SMEs, this is a very heterogeneous uh, group. And uh, I meet very often people who say, I am an SME in standardization, but maybe the person is an SME because formally he's a one man consultant, a one man show, or, 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 or a micro company, uh, but it is a consultancy and they are in standardization because they are paid by a large multinational from China mm. to advocate for their own interest. This, unfortunately, is happening, and this is happening very frequently. And, of course, nobody is against uh, you know, <laughs> a, 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 the freedom of doing business, right? So everyone can do, especially in the SME world, everyone can do whatever they want. But when, we, when the Commission provides financial support to schemes you know, for the participation of European SMEs internationally in light of digital sovereignty, how are you going to check that the SMEs uh, that go internationally are actually representative of you know, European interest? I'm telling this because I know the scheme of SBS because I'm very familiar because we are part of it. Uh, the, the system is quite clear. There is a governance model whereby decisions are taken by essentially the membership and there is a board and to be in the board you have to be an SME association with strong roots in Europe and an SME association as such you know, confirms that you are representing the interest of, of that community. Uh, of course, everyone can be infiltrated, right? No one, no one. But it is a strong system, at least, to, to ensure that, uh, you know, th th there is a strong anchorage to European interest. Uh, what about the other projects? What about the other initiatives? How are you going to make sure? Because you are asking Getty not to review their governance because Breton said there are, you know, no European interest in there. Uh, what is going to happen with uh, the other, uh, the, all, the, all the projects that the Commission finances? I really love your follow-up questions, Sebastian. <laughs> no, but this is really an interesting subject. And, and uh, this is partly also when we call for improving the transparency and the governance of the ESOs, not only ETSI, but of, of the three ESOs, then this is one of the things that can come out there. And you are absolutely right. They, 
the issue is we have a definition of SMEs that uh, take into account objective uh, parameters like uh, the number of uh, full-time employees, 250, the, the, the turnover and uh, the balance sheet. And then you are absolutely right, and this is something that uh, it can be looked at in the, in the different composition of the standards development organization. Whether an SME that fills with the definition, with this definition, is a, a technical SME, uh, when I mean technical, that is making technical contributors, contributions to the standardization in the field of activities, or rather they are consultants, and we need to have consultants because uh, you need experts in standardization, and it's a complicated topic sometimes. Fine. But if there are consultants and they are um, working and sponsored by either big multinational associations or associations of different uh, uh, industry um, interests, which is fine, but it's true that this maybe needs some reflection whether we should support in the same way. Because if they are already sponsored by big multinationals or big associations, then they may not need the support of the European Commission. Now, this we have in the past with some research projects. For instance, in the one I was mentioning to you uh, regarding the, the support or, or to, to the participation of SME in standardization, what we made there is we look at the NASA code. And then if they are consultants, it's clear, they have a specific code. And if they are uh, other SMEs with other, then they have uh, other NASA code that refers to uh, telecommunications, computing, agriculture, uh, maritime, whatever. And there, maybe we can look and make some, some differentiation, so in order to have a clear landscape. Then for the evaluation, for instance, of the EU interest, uh, and whether they are these SMEs or not, we are facing this in standardcity.eu, and no, it's not easy, so we try to to, to provide a clear guidance to the evaluators how to do it, but you should also take into account that you have to find the balance. If you to put too much burden into the evaluation system, then it becomes too complicated and SMEs will not use it. So the dif difficulty is finding the right balance. We are trying to do it. There will be cases and escapes, but uh, yeah, I call for a general reflection how to, to reflect better which uh, are the SMEs or startups that need to be yeah, supported. Okay. But Anyway, good to hear that, first of all, the Commission is investing in, in, uh, in, in those programs and that uh, these issues are on your radar. Um, with that, I'd like to ask uh, all the speakers for a final uh, reflection, your conclusions of, of this panel, because be, before, before we, we actually uh, fin finish our, our conversation and uh, if there is still uh, someone with a burning question, we can, we can also take it. I saw there is a, a comment uh, about uh, some, some uh, report available in the Stand ICT uh, web, website, standict.eu, which I invite everyone to check. Uh, so perhaps, Margot, would you like to start? Uh, not really, not really a conclusion, but it's true that uh, building on what was said, uh, <clears throat> the uh, um, standardization is not an exact science. It's uh, something which is uh, uh, in constant uh, uh, research of an equilibrium, and obviously the context is changing this equilibrium these days. I think in the coming months, the Commission intends to reform a little bit, etc., and I think we need to be very, very conscious of the uh, incredible market power Europe has with the machinery it has today. Uh, adjust what needs to be adjusted. It, there's always things to be adjusted and done better, etc. But I would recommend we, we are very cautious not to, not to throw away the baby with the bathwater uh, because standardization is an element of EU competitiveness and sovereignty, even though, or at least projects economic and soft power uh, altogether. So I think we need to be very aware of this. It is not a technical discipline. It, of course, the output is technical. It is not a technical discipline. Since the inception, standardization has been a question of, of, of power. So, and, and so you cannot just you know, decide that some kind of agency, et cetera, would just be better off. That's not how it works. Thank you. Thank you, Margo. Constant? Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe the opportunity to, to shed some light on a, would say, a recent practice in terms of um, 
standard development for those regulatory areas where the, the European Commission issues standardization requests before the, the legislation is already entering into force, giving us the, the time to anticipate. And that's something that we see that is really critical to, to, to start the development of standards as soon as possible because it takes two or three years, but also to, uh, to, to bring together all the international colleagues, all the uh, stakeholders, including SMEs on, on board at an early stage. So that's a, a very good practice from our perspective and, and hopefully it can continue in the future. But then, yes, yeah, so, so, so many topics, we could have spent time also discussing patents because when we address innovation, uh, market access, I think the, the, the issue about patents is also very much relevant, especially for SMEs. So, so I think, yeah, we'll have to, to continue the discussion, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Kostan. Emilio? I think I have already talked too much. Sorry, we tried to <laughs> No, I think digital standards are important in order to, to support the EU sovereignty and the digital single market, the single market and the competitiveness of the European companies as such. And we need a strong European standardization system based on good governance, transparency, openness, trust and cooperation. And there, uh, we need that, that all the different partners uh, are included and cooperate. And, and one particular important partner are SMEs because they are innovative and we believe it's very important that SMEs will be included in order to also to bring uh, and defend the EU values uh, and interests, not only at European level, but also internationally. And, and again, it's important that we build uh, and leverage on the strength of the European standardization system and European standards in order to be influenced uh, globally because Europe uh, uh, and European experts need to be present uh, and defend the core values and interests of Europe in international standardization. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, with this, I think we can uh, we can conclude. I see there is no other question in the in the chat. Uh, we heard very interesting things. I think everyone uh, agrees that. Uh, cooperation is uh, the key uh, the, the mode uh, of uh, success for for the european standardization system um, in europe and internationally uh, it can and it is supporting digital sovereignty i also want to conclude with a very positive news that has come up during our forum is that uh, uh, the candidate, the American candidate to the ITU has made it uh, to the election, Doreen Bogdan Martin, uh, first female uh, to, to chair the, the, the ITU. So I think it's also uh, very much fitting the topic of today. So, uh, you know, uh, our own geopolitical, uh, um, geopolitical uh, uh, balances and uh, the interest of uh, you and the us in this are quite aligned um so we'd like to thank everyone um and uh, looking forward to see you next year for the 2023 ict forum uh thank you again for your participation thank you very much bye-bye